Well, hi all, my name is Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester. I work for the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And we're here today to talk about old growth forests. I have a lot that I wanna say about old growth forests. I think they're really cool um, and important and it could probably be many hours of presenting, uh, but I'm gonna try and cram it into 20 minutes. So I would say that if this goes by a little fast and you wanna watch it again, you'll, we'll be recording this. So you'll be able to watch it on my YouTube channel, the Vermont Woodlands Association YouTube channel, and the Vermont Coverts uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, I also want to say that we got people like Charlie Cogbill and Liz Thompson and Nancy Patch in here who wrote the book that I just read. So I hope that uh, they will be forgiving if I get something wrong. With that, uh, I'm going to share my screen and away we'll go. All right, so uh, my role in this is basically to define what old growth forests are and to talk about some actually opportunities of uh, management and sort of the emergent field of ecological forest management and specifically managing our relatively young forests to be more like old growth forests. So what is a forest? And so I think that this is, you know, this is a basic question, but this is actually really important. So the, these Definitions are what come up if you search for it on the internet. A large area covered chiefly with trees and undergrowth. A dense growth of trees and shrubs covering a large area. A large area full of trees, usually wild. And so uh, what's meaningful about this, I think, is that we have largely and historically defined forest as basically just a bunch of trees. And as our understanding of what forests are uh, broadens and improves, you sort of based on uh, increasing awareness of the different aspects of forests, maybe the different obvious parts of forests, we understand that this definition from wetland, woodland, wildland um, of a natural community is probably a better definition for what a forest actually is. So it's an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. And so what that means is that forests are systems and trees are a huge part of those systems but they are by no means the only part of the systems. There are other organisms, other non-living components, and even processes that are really, really important parts of how we grow uh, this incredibly complex system that we know as a forest, and yes, how we grow trees. So any discussion of, of forests, and especially old growth forests uh, in Vermont and in New England should be prefaced by some land use history. So Vermont in, um, prior to European settlement, we think Vermont was in excess of 95% forested. Um, but in the 1800s, this incredible, in an incredible feat of uh, effort by these early settlers who were doing all this with, with hand saws and axes um, and draft animals, cleared, we think, somewhere between 60 and 80% of the landscape, uh, largely for agriculture, but also, also just for some really intensive land usage practices. So the production of, of hardwood charcoal for the railroads is another example of how people were harvesting these forests very uh, aggressively. And so what that means is that basically every forest was cleared at that time. Um, every forest that you've ever been to, with the exception of very remote, very inaccessible, high elevation forest, stuff like that. And so the forests that we have, even though they may be relatively old, um, are actually in the great scheme of things uh, pretty young. The legacy of that, of that, of that land use of the 1800s is that our forests, as compared to for the forests that preceded European settlement and that land clearing of the 1800s are younger, obviously. Um, many of these forests uh, in Vermont were not, uh, you know, there was this sort of the big sheep, sheep boom, which was in the early to mid 1800s. And then a lot of uh, more marginal pastures were allowed to revert back to forests. Many of those were cleared again. But most of our forests are really young. So they're you know, between 60 and 100 years old. Uh, they are also less diverse just because uh, as forests develop as systems, uh, they become more and more diverse over time, different species of trees, different sizes and ages of trees. Um, and they haven't had time to do that. So you know, while we may have trees in our forests that are 100 years old, Forests as systems require many hundreds or thousands of years to develop. And as they develop, they also gain some of these other aspects that we'd associate with old growth forests, like big old trees, but also dead wood on the forest floor, dead standing trees, 
high amounts of soil carbon, deep well-developed soils. Um, across the landscape, we also lack the historical balance of young and old forests, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So all of our forests weren't old growth forests, they were a balance of forests in all different stages of development, including a lot of old growth, but also younger forests. Um, we also, our, our forest composition is totally different and Charlie Cogbill um, and others have uh, created some really amazing research talking about the species composition of our forest prior to European settlement and they were really different than they are now, um, largely because of the way that we treated them and also because of some other stuff like uh, invasive exotic pests and pathogens. Um, and in general, I think this equates to generally less healthy, and that's a loaded word, resilient and productive forests across our landscape. So there's this really interesting thing. Um, I could easily, instead of saying this is what we think old growth forests look like, also say this is what we think healthy or forests look like or well-managed forests look like. Um, there's this ingrained idea in many people where they, when, when they see a forest that looks like this, large, evenly spaced, old trees, nothing growing in the understory, that's what they think a really good looking forest looks like. Um, and that's not true. So as forests develop, they go through these different stages. So I talk about as forest development, we also call it succession in the forestry vernacular. Starting from a large scale disturbance like uh, a field or you know, like a, the effects of a hurricane or a large wind disturbance or a large fire or something like that, uh, forests start at this stand initiation phase characterized by shrubs, small trees, stuff like that. And eventually they grow into this, this stem exclusion phase. This is where all the trees are about the same size, the same age. They're often dominated by species which are faster growing. Um, and there's often a relative uh, dearth of understory, young trees, um, you know, stuff. When you look through these forests, in many cases, it'll look very clear in the understory. And that's just because all these trees are growing up and their canopies are knit really tightly together and they're competing with each other very aggressively. A lot of people think that an old growth forest looks like sort of at the end of this stem exclusion phase. So as these, as these forests compete with each other, they, or as these trees compete with each other, they get very, very old and large. Um, and you end up at some point usually with a bunch of trees that are all big and evenly spaced and they look like that picture. That is what traditionally in forestry is called a mature forest or sometimes an economically mature forest, but that's not an old growth forest. Forest development proceeds past that stage, and what you'll see is that as those trees reach their, their biological maturity, they'll start to fall apart, uh, disturbances will start to affect them, wind, disease, insect outbreaks, small gaps will start to develop in the canopy until you end up in this stage that we, would, we might call old growth or what's called here as gap dynamics. So that is really what old growth forests look like. They're not just these, this sort of monoculture of these big, evenly spaced, even aged trees. They're actually this, this incredibly diverse array of all trees of all different sizes and ages and species. Um, they are interestingly also, um, while change and death and disturbance is a constant in these old growth forests in this sort of gap dynamic stage, uh, these forests as a system are actually much more stable over time because they're not a monoculture of any one uh, tree size, tree age, tree species. This is a really useful uh, graphic that was developed by um, Aunt, uh, Tony D'Amato and Paul Cananzaro in this really great publication called Forest Carbon, um, an essential natural solution for climate change, which was published last year by the University of Massachusetts. Um, Tony, I will quote a lot, he's at, here at the University of Vermont and he's uh, on the cutting edge of ecological forest management and also um, understanding old growth and understanding these old growth conditions. And so basically what this shows is that as forests develop, so here's the development clock starting at zero and going all the way around to about 500 years. Um, on this inner circle, it shows how the, the species that dominate forests change over time. So you know, starting here at year zero, and again, this is like when you have a big disturbance, you know, a fire, windstorm, what we call like a stand replacing disturbance. You start with these shade intolerant species. So these are species of trees that uh, live less long and they grow really, really quickly, like our white birch, aspen, pin cherry, stuff like that. Um, as development proceeds, you will see that it goes from shade intolerant uh, species to more shade mid tolerant to more shade tolerant, which dominate. 
uh, as you get into this, you know, greater than 100, greater than 150 year old forests. You'll also see that what is depicted here in the green is uh, changes in carbon sequestration as a forest develops. So when you get around year 20 or year 30, uh, these are a lot of trees that are growing really quickly. They're sequestering a lot of carbon. And so you see it depicted as darker green here. As the trees get, as the forests get older, I should say, they sequester relatively less carbon, but you'll see depicted here in the brown, uh, carbon storage in that system steadily increases. So the development of forests, and this is a really important concept, is a continuous process. Um, it doesn't just start and stop when a single generation of trees uh, gets old and dies. You'll see that this forest, as measured by this carbon sequestration, and, and the development of their soils and the development of a lot of other really important parts of the forest is actually a continuous process which goes well beyond that first generation of trees. Also it's interesting to point out um, a new forest inventory analysis uh, which is just a, an ongoing inventory process of judging what our forests are like over time came out for Vermont um, with data from 2017 and showed that uh, two-thirds of the carbon that's stored in our forest is stored below ground. So it's not in those big massive trunks and branches of trees, it's actually in the soils and roots and dead trees uh, and dead wood, which is a really important part of the system. So what is old growth? So it's really important to understand that old growth is a stage in forest development. It's a long lasting stage, um, especially in places which don't have big disturbances like hurricanes and fires regularly visiting the forest. Um, it lasts a long time. But it basically what it is, is forests which have developed without extensive disturbance, again, that sort of standard replacing disturbance that would bring forests back to year zero for a long period of time. But that doesn't mean that they're devoid of disturbances. So old growth forests regularly experience small scale disturbances like the death of a tree or the death of a small pocket of trees. Um, but they're, they are, have not experienced that much larger scale type disturbance, which would disturb tens, hundreds of acres, something like that. Um, there's this amazing resource here, uh, which is a, a literature review by Mark Lappin, who prepared it for the Vermont um, Natural Resources Council called Old Growth Forest, a Literature Review of the Characteristics of Eastern, Eastern North American Forests from 2005, um, which I'm citing here. Uh, they suggest that, you know, one benchmark we could, we could say for old growth is forests that are over 150 years old. So that doesn't mean, again, that all the individual trees are more than 150 years old. It means that the forest has escaped that large scale disturbance for 150 years. Interestingly, dead wood or necromass, which is a great vocabulary mm. word, characteristics that we'd associate with, with old growth forests. So large amounts of dead wood on the forest floor, dead standing trees, stuff like that, which are really, really important parts of, of forests may not develop until about 275 to 300 years. Prior to European settlement, about 55 to 60% of New England's forests were older than 150 years. And today it's about 0.4% according to that resource. And so because all the trees aren't older than 150 years, and we're talking about you know, sort of defining these systems as being older than 150 years, we usually define old growth structurally. So what that means is that old growth forests have, yes, some big old trees, trees that may be like this yellow birch are a couple hundred years old, but they also have a diverse, they have a diverse composition of many different species of trees. They also have many different sizes and ages of trees. So what we call structural complexity or structural diversity. They're not this sort of monoculture of just evenly spaced big trees. Uh, canopy gaps are also really important uh, in par a part of old growth forest. So that just means the death of uh, several trees that create sort of a hole in the canopy instead of having that continuous canopy that we'd associate with younger forests in that stem exclusion phase. Lots of deadwood on the ground um, and incorporated into the soils. That's really, really important. They also have these uh, deep, well-developed soils. So because these forests are developing continuously, basically nothing is going to waste, right? So that the dead wood uh, is being incorporated into the soil and you end up with these really deep, uh, well-developed, really rich soils. And again, this idea that there is no end point to the development of these forests when they're in this old growth stage, it's this continuous process. So why are they important? I'm just gonna check my clock here. 
So I really like, I think old growth forests are really important in that they demonstrate what forests are supposed to look like, how they manage themselves, how they develop over time. That's really, really important as forest managers because of course, why wouldn't we want to manage forests like they manage themselves, right? They are also, because they are so rare across our landscape, they also provide refugia and unique habitat conditions which are underrepresented across our landscape and also unique benefits and services uh, for the same reason. And also I would posit that they have some sort of intrinsic value, right? That they're beautiful, impressive, and important in their own right. And the species that are dependent on them have the right to exist. So traditional, I didn't know what to call this. I guess I called it traditional forestry. You could also call it old growth forestry. Um, and you could also call it just sort of economic forestry as it's currently practiced in a lot of places across the world. Um, is this idea that we're growing even age forests managed on these fixed rotations. Uh, we're growing regular crops of economically valuable trees focused on efficiency, uniformity, regularity, which are all uh, attributes which are, do not exist in these old growth forests, right? Which are sort of founded on irregularity, complexity, diversity. There's this idea from the early 1900s of the regulated forest and from foresters in Europe where we can grow trees as efficiently as possible by controlling every single aspect of how they grow. Uh, and especially, you know, based on, you know, removing what we call old decadent trees is the term that they use, which are not growing a timber product efficiently. Uh, and replacing them with thrifty trees, which are these young, fast-growing tree species. But then you lose all the benefits of old trees. Um, this type of forestry is not really based on the way that forests naturally grow and develop, except for some ecosystems which are, um, you know, really, really fire-prone or prone to like really large-scale disturbances, which are not super common. Um, and I should also mention that this is still the way that the vast majority of all timber is grown in the United States from our, our big timber capitals in the Pacific Northwest and especially in the American Southeast. So again, this is, this is basically, in most cases, a human created system to grow timber as a crop, not necessarily based on uh, an in-depth study of, of forest ecosystems. Now there's this idea, and I first heard about this from a paper in 1989 uh, by Jerry Franklin, where he talked about a new forestry, and this continues to develop. Ecological forestry is the idea that Yes, we can manage forests, but let's manage them like they manage themselves. So let's manage them as complex systems. And part of that is we're managing the trees, but we're also recognizing that forests are systems which include, but are not limited to trees. Um, I, you know, for me, it seems so obvious, right? Why wouldn't we want to manage these systems like they manage themselves? But that's not necessarily the way it's been done in the past. Uh, the principles of ecological forestry, we talked about continuity. So we're not just going in there, growing a crop of trees to their rotation age that we've decided is when they're economically mature and then cutting them all, clear cutting them. Um, we're allowing this process of continuous development to occur. Uh, we are fostering and enhancing these ideas of complexity and diversity in the forest. We're also managing the forest on a landscape context. So understanding that these properties and these areas that we're managing are not isolated islands, they're part of this larger landscape and then uh, doing uh, silvicultural intervention at appropriate, with appropriate timing. In practice, and this is a picture of me at the Heinsberg Town Forest where I've recently uh, completed a timber harvest using many of these principles, uh, what it looks like is that we are managing for many different ages, sizes, species of trees. We're retaining and also recruiting tons of dead wood and allowing lots of dead wood to stay in the forest. We are retaining and also recruiting, trying to make more of big old legacy trees or biological legacy trees that will never be harvested for timber. They're just, they just exist to confer to the forest the benefits of big old trees. We're also creating small pockets of early successional habitat, other unique habitat conditions which are underrepresented across our landscape, and protecting sensitive and unusual ecological features. Um, all right, I'm going to try and wrap this up in five minutes. So uh, I went to a presentation with Tony D'Amato recently and he, instead of talking about climate change, talked about global change. So this is basically the idea of climate change plus all of these other challenges and stressors that we're imply applying to the forest. So it includes the fact that we've altered natural disturbance regimes, introduced invasive exotic plants, animals, pests, and pathogens. We're converting, losing, fragmenting forests. We're polluting our landscapes. We're creating weird, wildlife dynamics allowing us to get to some stuff like deer overabundance which is a huge threat to biodiversity. Mm -hmm. 
it's really important that at the same time that we're looking at old growth forests as a reference condition for how do forests work, that we also have to understand that the forest that we're managing for tomorrow uh, will not be the same as the forest of yesterday. They're, they're, you know, the new generations of trees that we're growing now are going to mature in a completely different landscape with a completely different climate and totally different stressors. So what do we do about that? And I said that the forest of tomorrow will be different than the forest of yesterday, definitively. We manage for resilience. So a resilient forest is a forest that's capable of maintaining their health and these natural processes throughout great stress and change. And I pulled this from another resource by Tony D'Amato, Paul Cananzaro, and Emily Huff called Increasing Forest Resiliency for an Uncertain Future. The goals of forest, forest resiliency, number one, we need to keep forests forested and connected. Um, and that's a baseline for everything that we want to do. Avoid fragmentation, avoid conversion of forest to other use. Number two, reduce these stressors like actively trying to lower the deer population, actively trying to limit the effect of invasive exotic plants, insects, pathogens. Reducing vulnerability by actively trying to make our relatively young, even-aged forests more like old growth forests. So enhancing that complex structure and reducing these large scale disturbances and also providing refuge. So maintaining the maximum level of plant and animal diversity over time are good places to start. Um, I also wanted to stress that there's this really interesting idea. This is an amazing resource called Vermont Conservation Design, um, which was produced by Vermont Fish and Wildlife and the Agency of Natural Resources and other partners and especially Eric, Eric Sorensen and Bob Zeno, um, that this idea that it's not all old growth forests, right? Like, uh, we need to also restore, in order to, to protect all of our biodiversity, we need to also restore a landscape which has a mix of different forest types. So uh, just to quote that, this first bullet here, a return to the pre-European abundance of young forest, which was approximately three to five percent of the forest, is needed to reverse a declining trend and to reach a level that at one time supported all of Vermont's native species that require young forest. And again, these are just quotes from Vermont Conservation Design, which is an amazing resource. They also say, while it is not practical or possible to return to a landscape dominated by old forests, allowing about 9% of Vermont's forests, remembering that it was probably 55 or 60% prior to European settlement, to become old forest will bring this missing component back to Vermont's landscape and offer confidence that, this, that species uh, that benefit from or depend on this condition can persist. In most cases, passive restoration will result in old forest. In some cases, active forest management may prom promote forest composition and structure suitable for subsequent passive restoration. Here's some research. So I know that that was a lot and that that was really fast and that even so I'm still over my time, but here's some resources. I can put this slide up later too that are really, really important. Increasing forest resiliency for an uncertain for future. That's a really cool workbook um, that you can actually sort of go through and there's lists you can check off about your forest. This publication, Forest Carbon, which is also just about how forests work. Um, again, by Paul Cananzaro and Tony D'Amato. Uh, Vermont Conservation Design, which I just alluded to. This Restoring Old Growth Characteristics workbook, which I sort of alluded to in my discussion of, of uh, ecological forest management, also by Tony D'Amato and Paul Cananzaro. And then this literature review is, is dense, but is really, really important. Um, again, by Mark Lappin and put out for the Vermont Natural Resources Council. Um, I'll take your, I know there's going to be questions. I'll take your questions in a second, but first I'll stop sharing my screen and we'll pass it off to Sue. So Ethan, I'm going to give you one question that I have here on the topic of wild, and this is from Michael Quinn, on the topic of wildlife habitat improvement, a Vermont forester said he'd rather cut 10 live trees than remove one dead one. I agree with the forester. What do you say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot, again, I really believe that, that humans, you know, and, and again, recognizing that with old growth, there's all this really interesting discussion about the role that humans have in these environments, right? And recognizing that there's something really special that happens when uh, forests are left to their own devices and allowed to do what they need to do. But at the same time, I think that there is a positive role that humans can have in the forest. Um, and I think that uh, our, in many cases, our instincts or our tendencies towards forest management are wrong. So we want to clean the forest up, right? We want to make it look like a park. We want to make it look aesthetically pleasing. And so people 
you know, instead of cutting a live tree, we'll just be pulling out deadfalls. That dead wood is really important habitat for like a huge array of different amphibians, reptiles, in addition to forming the soil that'll be our future forest. And so what I would rather do is spend your time and your energy <clears throat> doing, you know, uh, creating more structural diversity in your forest, helping thin around trees so that they're less, they'll have more tools in their toolkit to deal with the stressors of climate change and they won't have to deal with competitive stressors. Doing stuff like that actively and proactively. Um, once a tree's on the ground, I'm like, well, problem solved. You know, this, that is a really important part of the process, which has a lot of value. Thanks, Ethan. Sue, you want to put your screen up for us? <laughs> yes, no. That looks sounds good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can everyone hear all right? Yes, I can't hear anybody. We can hear you, Sue. Oh, good. Okay, good. Well, uh, bravo to Ethan and, for that matter, all of his forestry colleagues who are on to this uh, wonderful approach to managing forests. What I'm going to be talking about today is, is a partner to that, and, and an important one for reasons that I'll stress again and again, and that is the opportunity that some of us here in Vermont, and throughout the world for that matter, might want to consider permanently conserving our properties as wildlands. And so uh, I, I'll start with the obvious. I mean, these big trees really move us. And they really inspire us. Uh, they teach us patience. They teach us humility in the face of a world that we really don't understand fully, even though we sometimes think we do, and a world that increasingly we've harmed. So we need these qualities. We need to immerse ourselves in a world like this. We need to be surprised out there in the woods as, as uh, uh, Eric Sorensen was. I was with him on a field trip on a client's property and we found this grand old white oak and what a treasure that tree was. To know that there'd be forests, whole forests over the next several centuries that would be allowed unimpeded to grow indefinitely uh, and have more big old trees like this and have more coarse woody debris and all of that, that's, that's special. And some of us might want to consider doing just that. My specialty, of course, is, is learning about what the animals are doing out there. And I came onto this discovery about 45 years ago. And I've dubbed the, this particular phenomenon babysitter trees. I have a section of woods, which I now own and have permanently conserved with the Northeast Wilderness Trust, in which there are old trees, trees that are well over 90 years old, some older than that. And unlike other parts of the forest all along this watershed, my property suddenly becomes a magnet for mother bears and their infant cubs. So every April I have data on bears arriving and using these big old trees. What's that about? Well, I think the bark structure, especially of hemlock and pine, that's tight and doesn't slough off as readily, easier for those cubs to climb with their little claws. As they pull themselves up, they reach a ladder-like spacing of big branches that they can grasp onto and rest on and even take a nap on. The whole purpose of babysitter trees is that mother sequesters her cubs in these big trees, sometimes for several hours while she feeds in the nearby woods. She can ill afford to have them out of her side. They're too vulnerable. And this is the only place in this whole watershed where I saw this happening again and again. And some of you may say, well, no, wait a minute, babies, babies aren't born every year to bears. So what's going on? The daughters of those mothers use those trees in alternate years. They are always in use, just like a good babysitter. On a, on a smaller scale, birds, uh, the more tip overs that are occurring in a, a, a fairly large woods that I've been studying for several decades uh, are really making a big difference 
for, uh, in this case, one species of bird that has grown dramatically, uh, and that's the winter wren. And what is he pointing at? Well, on the face of tip overs, there are all these little nooks and crannies tucked in under the root structures that become great refugia for this bird for their secret nest. By the way, I'll point out that this nest is lined with moose hairs. This is a big old witness tree that I took students to for decades. And, uh, you know, finally, it's now a standing snag. It's, it's, it's most of the crown is gone. Uh, as you see, the fungi are occupying it. But what I now am humbled and, and, and treasuring to realize is that this tree is living on and that there are myriad other organisms that are living within and under and around this tree that benefit from its presence. Birds, the, the keystone uh, cavity maker, the pileated woodpecker in our woods is uh, a grand example of the use of dead trees and of snags and of dying uh, larger structures and trees. So the structural importance of what we see in an old growth forest or a late successional forest uh, becoming old uh, is really important. Countless organisms depend on these uh, from, from bats to bears. We've seen uh, you know, all manner of animals and birds that use these cavities, including this American Martin. And there's some prizes in our forest. And while lynx here would not be an old growth obligate, it would not be an animal that depends on old growth. I think the point I want to make now is we citizens of Vermont and sistering states and provinces really need to be careful now uh, about the deliberate conservation of whole swaths of our landscape as permanent wildlands so that we keep in place a, a habitats that can allow wildlife to move about. I remember when uh, officials were saying we didn't have lynx in Maine. And I remember still further back, some saying we didn't have lynx in New England. Well, lynx proved us wrong. We found that we had more lynx in New England than any other place in the lower 48. And we've recently learned that we have links in Vermont. But the conservation on a landscape scale of the appropriate mosaic of lands is key. And I worry about those lands for reasons I'll talk about later. Uh, back in my woods again, I'm thrilled by what I see happening, especially over the last 15 years. Tremendous acceleration, rate of producing of gaps, openings to the sky that the sunlight pours down through and big old dead trees breaking and snags and sometimes a couple trees, sometimes a stand of trees will come down. And this is all very dynamic and all very good. And just think of all the wildlife beneficiaries of a forest that now suddenly becomes very complex like this. Many age classes of trees, shrubs, forbs, things growing uh, across space and time it's become a very, very exciting place. And, you know, some people would look at this and say, oh, what a mess. I don't want to go back there with a try and clean that up with a chainsaw. No, leave it alone. It is great. Uh, it's good stuff. Just think of all the amphibians and small mammals and, and even birds that can sort of tuck down in on that. These guys are especially sensitive to the impacts of rapid climate change because their, their tolerance of, of extreme temperatures is not good. Their tolerance of, of drying effects is not good. Uh, certainly drought poses some threats to them. Um, so the conservation permanently of large blocks of forests as old forests with all the woody debris and all the rotten logs and stumps and things really give these creatures a place to be. They can't disperse very far. They're not gonna put on a backpack and walk 10 miles to get to a different place. So where they are is where they've got to be. It's up to us to keep that there for them. Oh boy, what a mess, what a mess. Well, mess is really great. This is good stuff. There's a lot of carbon in there. There's a lot of habitat opportunities in there. 
There's also, there's also a post office here. And I have years and years of data of this stem that's attached to this log on the left, lower left, and that gets used as a, as a signpost, okay? And bobcats come for I have 40 years of data. They come, they come, and they backwards spray on the structure. I call it in your Facebook. Oh, what's that coyote learning from that message? I, I think the thing I want to emphasize here, and I know you all know this anyway, is what a wonderful world we live in. And wouldn't it be nice if we just had whole parts of our landscape devoted to just that? And let's just be there, hats in hands and wonder, and leave it alone. There's all kinds of diversity that begins to happen when trees get old. And there's all kinds of microsite characteristics and characteristics of bark and, and even chemistry that, that support the growth of other organisms that we just, it's not that we can't see these in younger woods, but nowhere near as much. Fungi are just an exciting part of the whole picture. And this big old rotten log is, is home to many organisms that in turn are eaten and used by other organisms and spread throughout the forest in the spores that are deposited in feces. And that's what makes the world go around. And animals eat lichens, for example, and other fungi. And you can see these raccoons are having at it. These, these uh, fungi growing on a rotten birch. And they're beautiful, just gorgeous. This kind of thing wouldn't exactly be welcomed in a highly managed young forest. Get rid of that thing. And I say no, quite the opposite. And what a wonder it is, even in a landscape like this in Northern Maine, surrounded by countless thousands of acres of industrial forests that really could be cut anytime soon, to find a great big old legacy red uh, spruce like this and realize that that's an old tree. That tree could easily be 150 years old. And what stories does it have to tell? And then there are other wonders, like the tree on the left with the bare claw marks climbing up at the American beach that's clean and smooth, looking for all the world like all the beaches we all remember as kids. And then the tree on the right that is pretty much horribly disfigured with beach bark disease. So what's going on here? Well, my friend Dave Houston taught me years ago, we shouldn't be in a hurry to cut beaches down because we think they're gonna die because some of them aren't. Some of them have much to tell us. Their genetics are different. Something, something, and he devoted his research to studying this. Something contributes to their resilience in the face of this non-native uh, disease, pathogen. So we need, we need wild forests, which really serve as for refugia in which we can, uh, and laboratories in which we can study and find these things and learn. So I'll conclude by saying, in order to safeguard biodiversity and healthy natural systems for children, uh, and indeed all that lives, we must inspire our Vermonters to celebrate the intrinsic ecological and economic value of permanently conserved forever wild forests throughout the state. And we can take our mar marching orders here from the internationally respected biologist E.O. Wilson, who says, I propose that only about half of the planet's surface to nature can we hope to save the immensity of life forms that compose it. The living world is in desperate condition. It is suffering steep declines in all levels of its diversity. Only a major shift in moral reasoning with greater commitment to the rest of life can we meet the greatest challenge of this century? Wildlands are our birthplace. I'll say that where I took this picture in the James Bay region in Northern Quebec, uh, home in the winter to millions of caribou at one time, 
Uh, now those herds have declined sharply. Uh, this place isn't safe. That's all I can say. And that's my take home message. We have to put aside what we will decree as a society, what will always be safe. They cut down a million acres a year of the boreal forest in Northern Canada to make throwaway paper. We've got to stop this. Thank you. Mute. Thank you, Sue. Um, I do have a question in the chat box. So you mentioned that landowners should conserve their properties. And oh, let me just, let me back up a minute. Ah, this doesn't always show me who this is from in my chat. Um, so let me see if I can figure that out. It's from John. From John, thank you. Um, you mentioned that landowners should consider conserving um, their properties as wildlands. Despite additions of things like estas, current use remains largely focused on timber production. How difficult is it to manage as wildland or manage primarily for wildlife and still remain in the current use program? So that's probably, probably a question for me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so the current use program, or it's the official name is the Use Value Appraisal Program. County Foresters spent a lot of our time monitoring that program. Um, it is, you know, one of the, the requirements of the program is that lands are managed actively for, you know, sort of in the legislative uh, language for the production of timber. And so that, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the only objective. That just means that that is... Uh, that it needs to be actively managed for wood in some way. Um, and right now, there isn't the option, you know, just per, the, per the, the, the statute, there isn't the option to have lands that, you're, that are in current use, but you're just completely not managing in any way ever. That's not an option. There is a, uh, an option to have lands that are already old forests uh, be kept as such. But um, I would say within that, that they're also, you know, when people think of managing or not managing forests, a lot of times they're like, okay, so we're clear cutting our forest or we're doing nothing. And, there, and you know, the, the type of stuff that I'm doing where I'm talking about ecological forest management, we're retaining big trees. We're not cutting every tree when they get big, retaining big trees, creating structural diversity, doing these sort of continuous small scale harvesting to increase the complexity of the diversity of the forest that is completely allowed. So it doesn't, you know, it's not just like the only goal for your forest has to be pure timber production, uh, but it does have to be managed actively in some way. Um, and we don't have the ability as county foresters to change that. It would be a legislative change to allow people to have their lands in current use and to not manage them at all. Thank you. And from Drew, over the past five plus years, I've been eliminating dense thickets of honeysuckle and buckthorn, which has opened up my forest to a new generation of trees, the majority of which are ash, but also some surviving elm. I'm wondering what the fate will be of these uh, young elm and ash trees as they face elm bark beetle and the emerald ash borer. Are they more likely to survive the first waves of the diseases given their youth, or are they just as likely to, likely to die off as they grow? You want me to take that, Sue, or do you want to do it? Go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think I know Drew. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things that when I talk about the forests of tomorrow aren't going to be the same as the forests of yesterday, part of that is because we have these things that we've introduced across our landscape that have changed the way that trees grow. So Charlie Cogbill, who's on this call, his work has suggested that our most dominant tree species in most of New England was American beech. Mm -hmm. These massive multiple hundred year old trees, uh, which were like incredibly important to our landscape. They're not present on our landscape in the same way now, partially because our forests aren't old enough to sort of transition to that 
uh, more shade tolerant species composition, but also because of beech bark disease, which is an invasive exotic disease, which is affecting many beech trees and preventing them from becoming those big old massive many hundred of year old tree in most cases. There is some resistance in the population that allows them to become large as well. Same thing with elm. So Dutch elms disease introduced pathogen that has prevented elms from most notably, you know, it was an ornamental tree lining all of our city streets. Uh, but also it was this incredibly ecologically important species in our wetlands and floodplains. Uh, neither of these species, beech or elm, are going extinct, but they, it has fundamentally changed the way that they grow. So those elm, probably what will happen to those elm trees is that they'll become reproductively mature, sort of teenagers, um, get to a certain size, uh, and then they'll be infected with dust elm disease and they'll die. Uh, with emerald ash borer, we expect that the vast majority of all of our ash species soon, or of all of our ash trees of, of the three different native species of ash that we have will succumb to that and die. Um, not all of them will, and so having, you know, one thing we're actually trying to do is retain ash and retain genetic diversity of ash and regenerate mm -hmm. ash so that we have a lot of genetic diversity, there's a greater chance that we'll be able to retain ash as a species and there'll be some variants within the population that are resistant to the emerald ash borer. And that's really what we want. And with none of these things, like when people think about beech or elm or ash and they're like, oh, this tree's gonna die, I might as well go ahead and cut it. They're also, when you do that, you're also eliminating the chance for that tree to express resistance to, to whatever is challenging it. Um, and so I would, in many cases, argue for patience uh, with respect to all three of those species. Thanks, Ethan. And just a comment, uh, Sue, at the end of your presentation from Mary Ellen. Great presentation. Thank you for confirming all that we care about. <laughs> and I will, uh, yeah, so a follow up to the wildlife. So you can't create a wildlife sanctuary no hunting or trapping in Vermont current use. You can post land in current use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a it's that's a, a thing that's often debated, but um, some people are are of the opinion that if you're in current use and receiving a tax benefit, that you shouldn't be able to post your land, but you you can. And from Mary, how should a person who lives off their land cut their firewood? Um, you you want to take that one, Sue, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Um, I would just say that, uh, you know, one thing that I'm looking for when I cut firewood, a, a lot of times um, you can do really, really good management as a landowner on your own land by pretty much just cutting firewood. And one of the ways you can do that is by a technique that is called crop tree release. And it's a, it's a cool technique because what you're doing is basically flipping the traditional way of looking at and managing a forest on its head. So instead of saying every tree that has a problem with it, I'm gonna cut it and clean our forest, which also we've talked about wanting to have old trees, wanting to have trees with holes in them, cavities in them, dead standing trees, all that stuff. Instead of just like trying to wipe all that stuff out, what you do is focus on uh, healthy trees that you want to specifically grow. So instead of looking at everything that needs to go, you're looking at what you really want to keep and you're individually releasing each one of those trees that you want to grow. And so, you know, you're helping them, them grow more quickly. Also, we know that those trees are going to be subject to all of these stressors related to a change in climate, right? And so one way that we can help our trees and our forests be healthier is by eliminating them from the, or relieving them from those competitive stresses of competing with their neighbors. Um, and so that's what I do a lot of times. And then the other thing is that then you're not cleaning up your wood. So then if there's a tree that has a hole in it and it's not competing with any tree that you're trying to grow, just leave it. And so in that way, you're you know, doing sort of prudent management for your healthiest trees, but at the same time, you're also retaining sort of non-commercial aspects of the forest, which is really, really important. Thanks, Ethan. Sue, so this is a question for you. What are a few of the most important features of our land we could be closely monitoring over the coming decades of you, as you have over the last four decades on your land? Well, I think wildlife is a great start. And with each passing year, with all the new knowledge you acquire as a result, you're your love will deepen and, and uh, 
you'll be surprised, as you heard me say this morning, that, that there are things that go on out there that I, I might not have anticipated 40 years ago. Um, I didn't realize 40 years ago how important a uh, coarse woody debris was because frankly, the forest didn't have any. And I had to, mm. I had to sort of open my eyes and see that developing over time. Although it kind of made snowshoeing difficult in the winter, bushwhacking, as I'm sure many of you know, it was exciting to see. But watch the animals, watch the birds, watch the insects, and, and, uh, and, and keep records. I, that, that's really the best thing you can do, and it's a lot of fun. Thank you. So from Steve, can we lightly manage or also simply do uh, a variety of harvest types and treatments to create a diversity across the landscape? Some places more intensely managed than others. Uh, it's kind of what I've been attempting to do and it seems like this fits in with UVA as well as trying to gain many of the benefits in your presentations today. Yeah. Totally. And I think that, you know, one of the interesting things is it's, um, you know, it's, it's just such a interesting sort of juxtaposition, right? Where like the, the sort of like traditional, like old school forestry establishment would say are, are very threatened by the idea of having unmanaged lands across our landscape. But as you sort of like, as we learn more about the way that forests actually work, we understand that there are benefits that are conferred by unmanaged forests. And and I, as a person who regularly uh, advocates for active management of our forests, do not feel at all threatened by uh, the idea of wildlands on our landscape. Um, and the idea that, you know, these lands confer something to our landscape that is unique and that is different from managed forests. But I also really believe in, in the active management of our forests, just like Steve's talking about. So active management, you know, of different levels in different ways, um, just really both uh, enhancing diversity and complexity on an individual property level and then ac across the landscape is, is really, really, really important. And so I think that there's room for a balance of all of those different things. And I, and I think that, you know, as, as both Sue and I would agree that, that I think that our landscape has, has room for all those things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. So um, this is a question from Margaret. Great presentations. Do you know of any legislative efforts to expand current use for conserving wild lands? If not, are there other incentives or rewards for wild lands? Do you wanna take that, Sue? Yeah, well, if you conserve your land, for example, as I have with the Northeast Wilderness Trust, you can work with your town listers to explore uh, the assessed value of your landscape now that it is stripped of you know, any um, uh, monetarily uh, valuable things that you can do with it. Uh, highest and best use, some call it, building houses and, and cutting trees and all that. And I'm not passing judgment on that, except to say that when you permanently conserve your land as wildlands, you are agreeing to not do any of that. I can't put a lean to on my lands. So that said, um, the value of my lands as uh, a developable that property uh, goes down. And so my taxes accordingly uh, went down in the town of Jericho. So that's certainly one uh, perspective you can explore. Um, so I, I would first find a, find a way that you want to conserve your land in Vermont uh, and throughout the Northeast. The Northeast Wilderness Trust is a great land trust. I believe the Upper Valley Land Trust offers uh, similar opportunities. Um, but again, I want to emphasize there's, as, as Ethan has said, it's all good. And whether you're managing your forests in this way that Ethan has talked about uh, and, and that I'm an excited student of, or you're wanting to conserve your lands permanently as wild, it's all good, it's all good. And I see, thank you. Sophie has put a link in here for the Northeast Wilderness Trust. Thank you for that. Um, and there is a little uh, call out here, a little shout out for Tree Farm uh, uh, from Mary, a member of the Tree Farm Program, Wood, Water, Recreation, and Wildlife. 
That is all part of managing for Tree Farm. So thank you for that. As the director of the Vermont Tree Farm Program, I appreciate that mention. So from uh, Lena, is it possible to maintain an old, whoops, an old growth style system in small urban yards? In the spirit of Doug Tallamy, or are there sizes of land that are just too small to be useful? What do you think, Sue? Well, uh, the great naturalist and anthropologist, uh, Lauren Isley, uh, the late Lauren Isley, once marveled at what he felt was a universe of life in a puddle on a rooftop in Philadelphia. And I'll never forget that. He's a great author. I highly recommend his books. Uh, the most famous one is The Immense Journey. So knowing that life is really far more complex and, and uh, wondrous than we even know, I would say start with what you have. Um, get some structural diversity happening on your property. Maybe it's only uh, 25 feet by 50 feet. Get some down woody debris there. Get some logs. Your neighbors may wonder what you're up to, but uh, I guarantee you'll see an increase in the, the flora and fauna that come to inhabit those places. Stop mowing it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And then there are some comments uh, from Zach. I encourage landowners to learn more about how large trees continue to sequester high levels of carbon. Uh, old trees sequester and store more carbon than young trees. There is a link here, uh, shed light on the value of old forest. Um, and from Mary, can you mention the old growth forest in mid Vermont? I forget the name and its history. Gifford Woods is, I believe, the property or plot she's talking about. I can't tell mm -hmm. you much about its history, but Thank God it was conserved. And who knows, maybe 50 years from now, we'll be able to mention hundreds of other similar forests that are in the happy business of getting old and rich uh, because of our efforts to steward them and, and in some cases permanently conserve them. I, w I would love to also um, respond to that first question, Kathleen, about from Zach. So what Zach said to as a reminder uh, is that I strongly encourage landowners to to learn about how large trees continue to, to sequester high levels of carbon late into their lives. Old trees sequester and store more carbon than young trees. This is commonly misunderstood. This document, and then he, he's got a link to this document. So we, in thinking about how to manage forests, it's, it's a really interesting question of how we manage forests um, in light of a change in climate. And, and again, that's sort of the idea of global change as well, where we have not just a change in climate, right? Also, but also mass extinction of species, and you know these invasive exotic pests and plants and insects and animals. And pat, you know all these different things, pollution and forest fragmentation, forest loss, development, all these other things, which are also happening at the same time. But thinking about it is really prudent to think about forests as a tool in the mitigation of climate change, right? Because forests sequester and store a lot of carbon, and those two words. Um, can get sort of confusing. So sequestering is basically how much they suck, how much carbon dioxide they suck out of the atmosphere. And storage is their ability to then fix that carbon uh, in the in the forest itself. And so, uh, you know, uh, I think an industry talking point has been for a long time that like that young forest, the young trees sequester more carbon than old trees. It's not true uh, because we know that old trees are are continuing to sequester and store. A ton of carbon even as they as they become very old. What is true is that young forests sequester more carbon than old forests, but that doesn't mean that we should cut clear-cut all of our forests and make them young forests so they sequester more carbon. As that uh, graph or that, that the forest development clock from uh, Tony and Paul's resource about forest carbon demonstrates, even though the sequestration of carbon is greater when forests are younger, Again, forests, not trees, but forests. When when the forest itself is younger, the forest continues to aggregate to to store more carbon throughout its life. So those are those are two different things. The other interesting thing, though, to think about with all that stuff. Again, think broadening from climate change to global change is also thinking about 
that there may be there may be situations where we don't manage forests for maximum carbon sequestration and storage all the time. And so an example of that is creating like young forest, which is a habitat condition we know to be underrepresented across our landscape, which is not a good way to store carbon, but is a good way to protect our, our uh, native species diversity who depend on that habitat type. Thank you, Ethan. We are actually beyond time here, but let me just make a few more comments. Uh, John has uh, mentioned Vermont Coverts, their cooperator training that goes into much more depth on some of the topics we've touched on today. Uh, that's uh, vtcoverts.org. Uh, we should also mention uh, Keeping Track. You can look at Sue's website, keepingtrack.org and uh, vermontwoodlands.org for a lot more resources if there's anything you wanna follow up on. Um, and then uh, certainly lots of um, kudos to both of you. Um, awesome presentation, so interesting. Thank you so much, Sue and Ethan. Um, so much to learn from you both. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there any other last minute comments or questions before? Yeah, I would, I didn't get a chance to do this. I was hoping it might come up in the question and answer section, but I want to just quickly show, Ethan mentioned a couple of texts that he was uh, very indebted to and, and impressed by. I certainly am uh, indebted to this and very impressed by it. And this, this certainly gets into a lot of the managed old growth forestry principles that Ethan was talking about. Uh, they have the link. And then this is an organization called the Wild Seed Organization, uh, Wild Seed Project based in Maine. And, but, but anybody all over the United States would be fascinated by this because it's, it's about plants and native plants and and what we as citizens can do to uh, support them. And um, this, this magazine also often has an, a very, very wonderful article in it authored by Mitch Lansky. And uh, he uh, really writes again and again about old growth and about biodiversity and so on. So have fun looking into that. Thank you, Sue. What a great presentation. There are just so many comments here uh, um, in the chat box for both of you. Um, and yes, this has been recorded just to let you all know. If you want to review it, it will be on the uh, YouTube channels for Vermont Coverts, Vermont Woodlands, and Ethan's YouTube channel. So, um, all of that will be available and we can post the chat box as well, which has a lot of those links. So um, you, can, you can download that too, or we could send you all a bibliography because we have your emails. <laughs> so great information. Oh my gosh, so much to, so much to learn. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you and Lisa for hosting us. For sure. Lisa, any last comments? It's always fun and it's always interesting. You know, as a landowner, you can make your decisions. And so getting this kind of information about a choice to manage for old growth forests, a choice to conserve, a choice to do, you know, depending on what your goals and objective are, objectives are as a landowner, really gives you the opportunity to do great things for our forests and our wildlife here in Vermont. So thank you all for being on here and being willing to listen and get that knowledge as you make decisions about the land that you own. Yep. Thanks so much, folks. <laughs>